If you open your Bibles back to Joshua 3 and 4, we'll be in Joshua chapter 4 tonight. And this morning we preached on the miracle. That's Joshua chapter 3. Didn't get all the way through that. I'm going to kind of sum up tonight. But this point in the, in the, uh, in the story, in the account, the children of Israel have now wandered for 40 years. After 40 years of wandering, they're back to the Jordan River uh, where they had been previously uh, a little bit, a long while earlier. And they're supposed to go across the Jordan River, but they had a water problem. I mentioned this morning that I can identify with that because this past weekend we had a water problem. It wasn't as big, as wide, or as deep as the Jordan, but it was nonetheless a water problem. But God is in the business of drying up the water, amen? amen. And in your life you may have a water problem that may look like water, it may look a little bit different than that, but God wants to do something. This morning we looked at how, how God had, or they were commanded to do a few things first, and there's a, there a seriousness to it to get ready for it, but also there was a, a command, a statute. And what happens is different than when God parted the Red Sea. When God parted the Red Sea, Moses held his staff up and the waters began to come, and, and that night the, the wind blew all night long, and, and then at that point God parted the Red Sea and they could see the waters parted and they walked on dry land. When you come to the time of the Jordan River, when that was dried up for the children of Israel, it was a different miracle, a different beginning to a miracle. This morning we mentioned how they had to follow the ark, and they'd never followed the ark before. They'd followed the pillar of fire, and they followed the cloud, but they'd never followed the ark of God before. Yet they're commanded to follow the ark about 2,000 cubits, or about 1,000 feet, three-quarters of a mile back from that point. They could see it. Everyone could see it. And the Bible tells us in Joshua chapter 3 that when the, when the soles of the feet of the priest touch the water, the water's boom. They're far enough back that everyone could see that. But can you imagine being the priest, the first priest to touch the water? Not the priest in back, the priest in front. Do what, Joshua? Walk in the river. Joshua, you go first. You're our fearless leader. We love you. You take the first step. No, 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 no. God wants you to take the first step. And those, I believe, two priests, one on each side with the poles, touch that water. Boom. I don't believe that their foot got wet at all. God doesn't do half-hearted miracles. And where before during the night the children of Israel could, could see the wind of God, now they could see the power of God, see that water just part. What happened in this particular miracle is that the, the Ark of the Covenant then went and the priests stood in the middle of the Jordan River. They didn't continue to walk because we found out when they walked to the other side, once they walked out of the river, the water came rushing back. Last time at the Red Sea, when the children of Israel got across, the Egyptians came after them. And God caused the water to go back over the Egyptians. This time the, the priests stood in the middle and everyone walked past the Ark of the Covenant stood in the middle providing and showing a place of safety what God can do tonight we come to chapter 4 it's Memorial Weekend and this is God asked him to put up a memorial to what he had done Joshua chapter 4 the Bible says and it came to pass when all the people were clean passed over Jordan that the Lord spake unto Joshua saying take ye twelve men out of the people out of every tribe a man and command ye them, saying, Take ye hence out of the midst of the Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, twelve stones. And ye shall carry them over with you, and leave them in the lodging place where ye shall lodge this night. Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had prepared of the children of Israel out of every tribe of man. And Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God in the midst of Jordan, and take ye up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder, according unto the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you, that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean ye by these stones? Then ye shall answer them, that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it passed over Jordan. The waters of Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever." The children of Israel did so as Joshua commanded and took up 12 stones out of the midst of Jordan as the Lord spake unto Joshua according to the number of tribes of the children of Israel and carried them over with them unto the place where they lodged and laid them down there. And Joshua set up 12 stones in the midst of Jordan the place where the feet of the priest which bear the ark of the covenant stood and they are there unto this day. For the priest which bear the ark stood in the midst of Jordan and everything was finished that the Lord commanded Joshua to speak unto the people, 
according to all that Moses commanded Joshua, and the people hasted and passed over. And it came to pass, when all the people were clean, passed over, the ark of the Lord passed over, and the priests in the presence of the people. And the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh passed over, armed before the children of Israel, as Moses spake unto them. About 40,000 prepared for war passed over before the Lord in the battle to the plains of Jericho. On that day, the Lord magnified Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they feared him as they feared Moses all the days of his life. And the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Command the priests that they bear the ark of the testimony, that they come up out of Jordan. Joshua therefore commanded the priests, saying, Come ye up out of Jordan. And it came to pass, when the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord were come up out of the midst of Jordan, and the soles of the priests' feet were lifted up unto the dry land, that the waters of Jordan returned unto their place, and flowed over all his banks as they did before. And the people came up out of Jordan on the tenth day of the first month and camped in Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. And those twelve stones, which they took out of Jordan, did Joshua pitch in Gilgal. And he spake unto the children of Israel, saying, When your children shall ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean ye these stones? Or what mean these stones? Then ye shall let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of Jordan from before you until you were passed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up from before us until we were gone over. That all the people of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, that ye might fear the Lord your God forever. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your power. Lord, I pray that these next few moments you would help. Help me as I speak, Lord. You'd help people who listen. Help our hearts to be open, Lord. Bind the devil and his demons. Lord, would you touch us through your power? Or help us to respond the way we ought to to you. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. We memorialize a number of things. I still remember the day, September 11th. After that event when the Twin Towers came down, I was speaking to my mom and she said, this will be like the assassination of Kennedy. You'll remember exactly where you were when that, well, she goes, I remember where I was and you'll remember where you were when this happened. And she's exactly right. I can still remember where I was sitting in college, what class I was sitting at when the news came across that the towers had been, had been hit. They've done different things to memorialize that event and the people that lost their lives. There are some good things we memorialize and some not so good things. In the United States, we sometimes put up statues and monuments to those people who have gone to great sacrifice and, and given their lives or done something great in history. In fact, down south, you can go to very many different statues of great military generals, and now they're, of course, embroiled in a controversy over whether they should stay standing or, or be torn down. Well, beyond that, we, we put up statues of sports figures. Not only do we, do we say, wow, it's wonderful if you can serve your country, we say it's wonderful if you can play basketball. Like somehow they're on the same level, the same playing field. We can do without basketball players. We can't do without soldiers. But they put up statues of sports figures and then they take them down when there's a better sports figure, when they find out weird things about them. But most of us don't have the, the finances or the wherewithal to put up those big brazen and bronze statues. But, but we still, in, in, in little ways, we memorialize different things. As a parent, I'm sure you've at one point or another received the, the Christmas, or, Christmas ornament with your child's handprint in it. Oh, what a beautiful little thing. Fits on every Christmas tree, right? Just fits right in among the garland and the lights and the clay. You'll go down the sidewalk and you'll see someone who let their kids smack their hands in the sidewalk, right? And put that date on there. But beyond that, we save and memorialize even, even odd things. Some people save their teeth. It's a child that when they got married, their mother gave them all the teeth they had lost as a child. She'd save them all. That's weird. That's weird. Mom, if you have my teeth, I don't want them. I do not want them. It's a lady who saved her mother's in a jar. She had her mother's false teeth and her father's glass eye. That's weird. 
Dad, if you have a glass eye, I don't want it. There are times that we tell people we're going to give them something they'll never forget. As a parent, I'm going to teach you a lesson you'll never forget. Memorialize this particular concept. And here in this passage of Scripture, God says to Joshua, I want you to do something that's going to stand for time. Fact is, according to the the, the timetable that I looked up, it's about 3,500 years ago this event happened. These particular 12 stones are now, in our estimation, nowhere to be found. Right? They can't find it. It's about in Gilgal is where now they suppose this spot exactly was now. And, and they said because of the, all the ancient, all the days that have passed, you can't find this. But, but God said, we're going to put something up here. We're going to put up a memorial so that when your children ask, hey, why is that stack of 12 stones sitting there? You're going to tell them something. You're going to tell them something about what I did for you. That maybe, just maybe, God wants us to remember what he's done for us. Maybe he wants us not only to remember it, but to pass on what he's done for us and let someone else know about it. It is no secret what God can do, what he's done for others, he'll do for you. Maybe, just maybe, we ought to tell those around us what God has done as well. We get into the what have you done for me now mentality. God, what have you done for me lately? I'm glad you answered last week's prayer request, but I got a big problem today. And, and God hears and answers prayers every single day and multiple times throughout the day, and he's never bothered by that. But here God says, Joshua, we're going to do something special here. We're going to make a memorial. I see a few things here. First of all, I see a preparation for that. I see a preparation, first of all, of the men. God says in chapter 4, Joshua, pull out 12 men, one from every tribe. Why don't you get 12 of the guys? And the Bible tells us here that, that Joshua says in verse number 4, he called the 12 men whom he had prepared of the children of Israel. If you're in the service this morning, in chapter number 3, you would find reference to the 12 men as well, that before they passed over, before they even followed the Ark of the Covenant, Joshua said, I need 12 men, and, and he got 12 men, one from each tribe. We don't know much about these men. We don't know, first of all, what they looked like. We don't know if they were strong or if they were weak. We don't know if they were old or young, if they were a leader in the children of Israel, or if they were a follower, if they were a child or an adult. I imagine them, because the Bible says men, to be at least 20 years old. And Joshua said, I need some men. The problem is, neither Joshua nor the men knew what was going to happen. That's a scary, scary obligation. When the leader of over a million people says, hey, I need 12 guys, thinking this is not going to end up well. Do I have to walk in the water like the priests? Am I going to be offered as a sacrifice? What, why me? Can't you use someone else? Now, when this whole thing is done, I would submit to you those 12 men were glad to be chosen and called out. When it was all done, they were glad to be one of those 12 men to say, I carried one of the, those stones. That's the one your dad carried, boys. That one right there. Right? But going into it, uh, not so much. It happens in the schoolroom. All right, teachers, students. I need a volunteer. Every, everybody's eyes, boom, right down there. They begin to study so quickly, begin to pray. Dear Lord, help me not to be called. What's going to happen? I'm trying to give away $100. Oh, oh, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. But these men were called out before they knew the task. And you know what? God is still looking for men and women who will be called out people. You say, well, I'll do it. What does God want? To follow him. You don't know what that looks like over there. He just says, hey, I need you, 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 and you. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. We ought to have a room full of volunteers for the Lord's service. I'm not just speaking of service as far as working in a Sunday school classroom and singing in the choir, those are good things. I'm talking about men and women who will say, God, you can use me. Amen. God, I want you to use me. If you need something done, Lord, I want to be your faithful servant. I don't know what you may call me to do. I don't know what it will look like, what it will entail, but God, you can use me. Without saying, God, you can use me, just let me know what it is first. 
Just, just feel the details. Let, let me know the, the test and the, the, the trial. And, and then once I know that, I'll, I'll figure out if it's worth it or not. He's looking for some people who say, that's me. Sign me up. And God, through Joshua, called out 12, 12 men. They were prepared. They were distinct, 12. Not only do I see the men, I see the memorial. They were stones, the Bible says, from the middle of the river. How'd those stones get there? Did it just happen that they happened to cross, a, cross the place that God had 12 stones? The whole Jordan River is not filled with stones. Was it an accident? Not that it's free from all stones, but it's not like they're everywhere there in the Jordan River. It was it an accident? And God said, I want you to grab, I want you to grab some stones. If, if God came to you and said, listen, I'm going to set up a memorial. I want you to grab a stone. Which stone would you grab? He didn't tell him which stone to grab. He said, there's some stones. Just grab them from the middle of the river. I don't want to grab the wrong stone. There are a few stones in the Bible. Maybe sometime we'll do a series on stones. I think Brother Ashley wants to send to school, right? You have David's five stones, five smooth stones. These were not David's five smooth stones. I'll tell you what, I mean, obviously they weren't, but, but they weren't even any remotely like David's stones. My favorite stone in the whole Bible is the one that was over the tomb of Jesus Christ. That one had a little facelift on it. I moved out of the way. It was a little bit of a bother to Jesus Christ, but then it wasn't a problem. The memorial, 12 stones, stacked up on the other side. There's this thing out there. It's been five or six years now where people at a beach or different places will stack stones. Have you seen this? Have you seen it maybe on the internet or maybe you've been different tourist sites and people just begin to balance stones. Have you seen this before, these, these balancing stones? We are on a hike. And uh, <laughs> I enjoy, my kids will tell you, like, I, like that, that, that mindset, there's a beautifully balanced stack of stones. Can I put one more on top of it? All right, and so, I mean, obviously someone spent some time doing this and you stack them up even higher or, or put the largest one that's just resting just perfectly so the next person is going to knock the whole thing down. Wonder what this memorial looked like when they got done. They knew after they grabbed these stones that it was going to be a memorial for generations to come for their children to see. You think they just tossed the stones down there in a big pile? Hey, there's a stone, there's a stone, there's a stone. Okay, we're done. You think they said, no, here's a stone. There I see some, some care they took with this memorial. Some concern. You know, it's a good thing to remember what God has done for you and take some concern and care in that. To take, maybe you need to write it down sometimes and say, God, this is what you did for me today or yesterday or last week. It is easy to forget what God has done. We'll have, time and have a time for testimonies and, and then you start to rack your brain. Yeah, what has God done for me? Oh, he's done something probably every single day. Memorial. See these stones but I see the mechanism by which they were moved. This intrigued me when I, when I read this. They grabbed these stones, the Bible says, and put them on their shoulders, on their shoulder. This was no small stone. This is why this wasn't the five smooth stones that David grabbed. So I got Mark Koontz over here, and let's see, pretend that Mark Koontz gets grabbed to be one of the men from the tribes of Israel to grab a stone. Now, I know Mark, he's, he's a friend of mine, and if I say, Mark, I want you to grab one of these stones in the middle of the river, it's going to be a, a legacy for ages to come to honor God, the God of the universe, the, as chapter 3 says, over all the earth. What size stone is Brother Mark Coons going to grab? The biggest one this guy can pick up, right? You know, Mark. Ugh! You're not grabbing this little hand-sized stone, Right? This is for the God of the universe. I'm grabbing the biggest stone. And if I sweat and almost die carrying this stone across the second half of the Jordan River, that's okay. I think I can make it. All right, these were large, large. It, what I'm trying to say by this is this took some effort. 
This was not an easy task. Because this was going to happen, I got Brother John Goldsworth over here. He also was called out, one of the men for the tribes, all right? I know it's hard to believe, but we'll pretend for a moment. <laughs> but if Mark grabs that big a stone, which one is Brother John going to grab? A bigger one, thank you. These are 12 men that are grabbing stones, right? Not 12 ladies, they're 12 men that are grabbing stones. Come on, men, right? You're like, well, if Mark's hearing that one, that's nothing when he sees my stone. Come on now, men. By the time this thing is done grabbing 12 stones, these are 12 large stones on their shoulder to set up a memorial. They're grabbing some big hunks of rock. It took some effort. A couple steps in. Oh, boy, I bit off more than I can chew. But I'm not letting Brother Mark see me sweat. I'm not letting the other million-plus people see me sweat. I carry this rock for the God Almighty. I'm setting this rock up for a memorial. This took some effort. This was not just, hey, whatever happens, happens. Boy, it took a little bit of exertion. I imagine they broke a sweat to get these large rocks. There was some artist renderings of what these rocks would look like, and boy, no one knows, but everyone knows what a rock looks like. So I kind of chuckle when I see artist renderings. There's 12 rocks, and they're just big rocks stacked on top of each other. It wasn't a small symbol. It was a big symbol. And I obviously read inside this account a little bit, but I can see those men grabbing a big rock. I believe you would and believe I would. So why don't we still pick up a big rock for the Lord? If it was that day and everyone's watching, you're going to grab a big one, but, but now we're quick, to, we're quick to take care of me. We, we don't want to have to ex, be, be expended for the Lord's service, do we? No, we don't want to have to actually break a sweat for the Lord. But the, I guarantee these men, by the, carrying on their shoulders, these were not small rocks, and we ought to have the same mentality. Hey, you know what? This is for God. If it takes a little bit of effort, it'll be okay. This is something for God. But then I noticed something else in this, in this passage. I don't think I gave this word to the screen, but I noticed something more. And if you look with me in verse number 9, Joshua chapter 4, it says, And Joshua set up twelve stones in the midst of the Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priests which bear the ark of the covenant stood, and they are there unto this day. Did you catch that the first time we read this in the passage? You see, they, they carried out twelve stones, and we know about those stones. They were big ones. They're on their shoulder. And they set them up outside where they camped near Gilgal. But then we find out that right in the middle here that Joshua had them bring 12 stones into the Jordan River. They say it's probably from a field nearby there or near the bank. And they carry these 12 stones and put them right in the middle where the priests were standing. They set them down there. The 12 stones that came out of the Jordan River, everyone could see these 12 stones no one would be able to see. When the priests went out of the river, the water came rushing back. This, the Jordan River, they say, can be anywhere from 50 feet to 200 feet deep. Beyond that, we know at the time of harvest, the Bible tells us the Jordan overflowed its banks. So very deep river. No matter how high they stacked these stones, they would not have been seen. They're right in the middle of the river. These 12 stones were, were not because God commanded, but because Joshua wanted to do something. I began to ask myself, why would Joshua have another memorial inside of the Jordan River? There are some crazy thoughts out there about this. I looked at some commentaries, and, and they said, well, this is a picture of the death of Jesus Christ. Okay, that's interesting. I, I don't get that. And someone else said, well, this is a picture of an unsaved Christian or an unsaved person because they didn't make it out of Jordan. Okay. I don't see that either. What I do see 
what I think. This is just J.D. Howell, okay? Because the Bible isn't clear why Joshua did this. But I see a man saying, God's going to set a memorial there, but I'm doing something here that no one else will see. No children will ask about this. But this is for our God. Our God is victorious. Our God part of the waters, and I saw this back at the Red Sea. I see again in the Jordan, and I'm putting these 12 rocks in here. And they're going to sit there on the Jordan River. And God, these are just for you. For what you did for us. You know what? We're carrying these out for everybody else. But God, we're going to carry these in because we want to dedicate something just to you. That no other nations will see and and no children will ask about. God, this this is between us. I can't prove that. And I may be wrong when I get to heaven. But I'm not wrong in the fact that we ought to do things just between us and God. I'm not wrong about that. Some things that, that you know what? Let your right hand, not your left hand, figure it out. Some things that are just between you and the Lord. Some things that say, God, this is between you and me. Mentioned that this morning about how I want to know that God works just for me. Just for me. Not to be selfish. But I need to know. My faith needs to know that God works for me. And Joshua sets these stones up. And the scripture says this, and they are there unto this day. Now, in a literal sense, this book was written, what the commentators say, about 20 years after this event happened. They couldn't have proved they were still there because, like I said, the Jordan River is a pretty deep spot. It's a pretty deep river. But they tell me. But this scripture is forever. And I have a feeling that God knows exactly where those 12 stones are right now. And the crazy thing is, the odd thing is, we still read about it. We still know about it. What Joshua did, what he did as a personal thing, be covered by the water, God saw fit to let every other Christian, everyone who ever opens the Bible, the Joshua chapter 4, to know about what Joshua did. He decided to open that up for all of us. I love the fact in this memorial Joshua did a little bit more to show God's power. But then I see not only the preparation, but I see the purpose. I see the purpose. Purpose of this memorial, number one, recognition. So your children know. Recognition. So your children understand. So people understand. This is our God. This is what our God can do. What can your God do? You're like, well, that sounds a little braggadocious. Are you not proud of your God? Is your God not better than the other gods? Or is he inferior to the other gods? Because I'm a little sick and tired of us acting like our God is a little bit inferior to other gods. We don't worship the same God as the Muslims do. Southern Baptist president recently published an article, uh, two years back published an article, how the God that we worship and the God of the Muslims are essentially the exact same God. I'm sorry. They're not. They're not the same God. All right, my God's name is Jehovah. My God gave me his book, and it's not the Koran. It's the Word of God, the Holy Scriptures. It's a different God. I'm not afraid of my God. In fact, I'm glad he's my God. Recognition. This is our God. He is our God. He'll guide us even to our death. Not only recognition but respect, but respect. If you look in the the last verse, verse 24 of chapter 4, that all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, that it is mighty, that everyone will know that this God that you serve, your God, he's mighty, he's strong. There is nothing too hard Just a few days from this point, they're going to walk around these walls of Jericho. And then those walls are going to be flattened like a pancake. They've actually found in archaeological digs the remnants of those walls. Our God is mighty. He's still mighty. I see recognition, respect, and reverence. The last phrase, that ye might... Fear the Lord your God forever. There's sometimes in, in the Bible the word fear means fear. Be afraid. 
When the disciples saw Jesus walking on the water, they were afraid. This word fear here does not have the same connotation as that. We, we're not, he's not telling us that we should be afraid of our God, but that we ought to reverence, or can I say it this way? We ought to worship Him. You might fear Him, might worship Him, the Lord your God, forever. Worship Him forever. That means not just on Sundays, but worship Him on Mondays. You can worship God as you drive to work. Worship your God forever. You can worship Him at work. They that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. The Father seeketh such to worship Him. We ought to reverence Him, worship Him. And God is always looking for more worshipers. A few short days before and after, we heard about Rahab and she'll be saved. Someone who was an Israelite who began, though, to worship God, who ended up in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. God's always looking for those to worship Him. And see, it remained. Remained in our, in our scriptures, a sign, a symbol. The memorial was still there to show what God did, what He wants to do. Oh, we save some weird things. But I wonder if you've saved, if you set aside what God has done for you. See, a sermon like this, you'll say amen. You're like, yeah, praise the Lord. You may be prompted to, to pray and say, God, thank you for what you're doing for me, for your might, and I want to worship you. And then if you're not careful, you walk out the door without a stone. You walk out of the Jordan River without any, without any thought of anything else and promptly forget what God has done. Another problem will hit and may hit tomorrow, tonight, or just uh, the life happens that way. And Oh God, I need your help again. And he'll answer that request and then you'll walk away again. And That's great. If we're not careful, we'll live our whole life without any memorials to God and what He's done. I'm not saying that we ought to memorialize things, and, but it's not a bad thing. I brought something special with me tonight. See, last week, Pastor Let and I transitioned. Obviously, many of you know that. That's why I'm preaching tonight, obviously. And Pastor gave me a few things that I appreciate the flashlight, which coolest flashlight. Gave me a nice pen. Gave me a no button. It's very handy. Especially for Mrs. Evans. But he gave me his Bible that he preached from when he was young. In fact, that's what I brought tonight to preach out of. Thought it only fitting on the first Sunday had to preach in his place, First Baptist Church, I use the same Bible that it says, Dr. R.B. Let Pastor. No small honor. Don't take it lightly. I don't. I have a few Bibles. If I lost them, I would replace them. This one, can we not say is irreplaceable? Can we not say this is a memorial? Right in a small way, I'm not idolizing Pastor Let, though I love the man dearly. His mark is on this place, an indelible mark. I have a little memorial of that. What memorial do you have for the Lord in your life? You say, kids, this is what God did. Co-worker, this is what God did. And I want everyone to remember what God did for us. Lord, I thank you for your word. Thank you for your power. Lord, it's no secret what you've done. But Lord, may we not hide it. May we remember it. May we share it. May we promote you as a mighty God.